he faced a sea that seemed vast and formidable, the restless deep of the Pacific Ocean. Yet he dared to sail upon it. Through widely scattered island archipelagos, he moved from landfall to landfall, brought with him his families and his gods. This is a story of a voyage, retracing the steps of those ancient mariners. Without compass or sextant, a crew of 15 men searches for landfall across 3,000 miles of open sea. It is a journey not only across distance, but across time. A journey into the geography of human courage and human pride. Hello, I'm Mike Farrell. Welcome to the best of the National Geographic specials, the landmark series of the National Geographic Society. With these timeless programs, we celebrate the spirit of man's quest for adventure, exploration, and a better understanding of ourselves. Discover with us a universe that still has infinite power to amaze and delight with its beauty, drama, and endless possibilities. Among history's vanished peoples, there are some who died violently, and some who disappeared slowly, being absorbed into the other cultures that overtook them. In our 50th state, native Hawaiians often feel they are fighting for cultural survival. Yet sometimes a single symbol from the past can help reawaken hope and pride, as when a great twin-hulled Polynesian canoe again rides the Pacific in the voyage of the Hokulea. The known world of the late 15th century almost entirely occupied by land. Despite early Viking voyages, few had ventured far upon the Western Sea. Not until Columbus would the Atlantic become a pathway for European man. Yet at least 4,000 years earlier, from offshore islands of Asia, unknown mariners already had begun discovery of myriad flecks of land scattered across 25 million square miles of the Pacific. Spreading eastward through Melanesia and Micronesia, the early voyagers paused for a thousand years in Tonga and Samoa. Then from the time of Christ, they ventured even farther into the unknown swept onward through the vast watery domain of the Polynesian Triangle. It was the canoe that made it possible, carved with tools of stone or shell, made stable by outrigger or twin hull, lashed together with the twisted fibers of coconut husks. Built over years by entire communities, provisioned by many hands, the Polynesian canoe received the mana, or spirit, of each contributor. And they, in turn, were the ohana, the family of the canoe. Driven by hardship or curiosity, carrying food plants and animals, canoe-born colonies set sail across the endless marches of unknown seas. Without instruments, they navigated by their knowledge of stars and winds and currents, of swells deflected from unseen islands, even the taste and temperature of the water itself. Hundreds of years before Columbus's voyage, these heroic children of the sea had made the epic discoveries of New Zealand, Easter Island, and the great landfall of Hawaii. But paradise makes houseboys out of heroes. Beauty is sometimes fatal to itself. Astride trade routes of the Pacific, Hawaii has been in turn a fueling station, a military outpost, a tourist mecca. Overrun by Oriental and Westerner alike, the outsiders called haoles, the islands have become a crazy quilt of races. 
tolerant, endlessly hospitable, native Hawaiians sometimes feel themselves strangers in a home taken over by its guests. In his studio, a Hawaiian artist paints the images of a past that now seems as insubstantial as dream. But one time expatriate illustrator in Chicago, Herb Kane has returned to the islands with a dream of his own, to recreate a Polynesian voyaging canoe and following the supposed path of ancestral mariners, sail from Hawaii to Tahiti and back. Among the island's wealthy Haole establishment, Kane's dream is shared by Tommy Holmes, renowned waterman and a legislative aide in the Hawaii state government. In anthropologist Dr. Ben Finney, they find an invaluable ally, eager to demonstrate that early voyagers could traverse immense distances with no navigational aids other than their uncanny knowledge of stars and sea. Thus, out of diverse reasons and high intent, the project is born. For Kane, the canoe is primarily a visible symbol of Hawaiian identity. For Holmes, a sportsman's challenge. For Finney, a scientific experiment. Yet, as founders of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, they will encounter complexities never anticipated. Taken for completion to a traditionally sacred place on Oahu, the canoe swiftly takes shape. Though the twin hulls are sheathed with fiberglass and the sails are made of canvas instead of woven leaves, the design is as true to ancient contours as research can provide. As the craft is assembled, so is its human family. From Haole to Hawaiian, from leaders to work crew, a new ohana is being formed after a pause of centuries. March 8, 1975. After months of labor, the great canoe stands ready in Kaneohe Bay, awaiting the centuries-old rites that will commit her to the sea. <laughs> her natural element. Ceremonially, ancestral spirits are invoked to accept this new traveler of wind and wave. to handle in confined waters, Hokulea is paddled toward the open sea. There, at last released from land, the canoe springs free. In a regal island tour, Hokulea will train teams from which the final crew will be chosen. One man already
already seems secure as crew chief, Kimo Hugo. Just get more blade and fall down. So you want to maintain your speed. And, and where the sail is round like this, the wind has to go faster, you see? So it, it, creates, it creates a vacuum. When you got down, your leading edge started to go out a little bit. You've got to catch the leading edge, slam it down as fast as quickly as you can. Unknown for centuries, each maneuver of the great voyaging canoe is at first an experiment. Yet, day by day, she reveals herself to her handlers. Though quick to run before a breeze, she is reluctant to point into the wind. At summer's end, Hokulea makes a hundred-mile crossing to Kauai on an overnight sail. After training a Kauai Island crew, the canoe will return to Oahu. There, during the winter, the crew will be selected and final preparations made for an April 1st departure for Tahiti. Jubilant at the canoe's flawless performance during the night's run, the crew prepares for the Kauai Island reception. seven knots during the sail, Hokulea has arrived ahead of schedule. Yet already an excited throng of islanders is waiting to greet her as she is paddled into the bay. custodians of a heroic myth, the freshly trained crewmen of Hokulea are rapidly becoming a new elite, like the canoe herself, a visible badge of pride among the Hawaiians. It's been a long time since a canoe like this has come to Kauai, and the last time it was tried, it was by Kamehameha, and he had a lot of canoes like this. But he, he came in anger, he came to make war. And you know what happened, the gods didn't like it, they caused a storm, and as a result, half his fleet got wiped out. We came in friendship, and as a result, we had a beautiful night of sailing. Like a fading image traced in memory, Hokulea hangs in the gathering dust. Yet the apparition is real. Across the centuries, the family of the canoe touch hands, each to each. On a Friday in early October, with green recruits added to the crew, 
Okulea begins a return run to Oahu. Sailing against easterly winds, she must tack widely on a zigzag course. Although the channel can often be wild and treacherous, weather predictions are moderate. Herb Connie estimates the Hokulea will reach harbor on Monday. On Saturday, in moderate seas with swells of 6 to 10 feet, Hokulea makes slow headway against a 20-knot wind from the east. Alan, how is that off? Hook up. Although one of the pukas, or compartments, in the starboard hull has begun to ship water occasionally, there is no alarm. Are you going to stay up there most of the time? Huh? Yeah, I want the head clear out and get it. As night approaches, Hokulea heads into a squall line. With David Lyman, Tommy Holmes prepares to take over their 12-hour watch. Still dependent on compass and sextant during training cruises, they get their course heading and six o'clock position. But daylight brings disaster. The starboard hull lies swamped. The first frenzied efforts of the crew have only worsened the situation. The sails are cut down and the deck shelter removed to be deployed as sea anchors. Without radio communication on board, Tommy Holmes begins a long paddle to shore on a surfboard to summon help. For Kane and the crew, there is now little left to do but wait. On the horizon, help appears. On its regular inter-island run, a passenger hydrofoil comes to the rescue. Swiftly, the craft takes some of the Hokulea crew aboard notifies the Coast Guard, and later picks up Tommy Holmes, still three miles offshore. Together! In silent humiliation, six months after she was pulled to her launching, the stricken canoe is now dragged ashore. to land by the Coast Guard. The hull is laboriously pumped out while press and television reporters try to ferret out details of the disaster. Whatever the causes, the once proud canoe is now a forlorn symbol of Hawaiian hopes. As a heavy-hearted crew dismantles the sails and sets them aside, in the minds of many lies an unspoken question. Will the sails ever be raised again? So water kept coming in more and more. We just we could not uh, keep up with the water that was coming in. Despite the fact that he himself was on watch the night of the disaster, Tommy Holmes, in a general meeting of the project leaders, is severely critical of Herb Kane for the lax discipline aboard the canoe. The crew members would inspect everything. Yeah, no, not inspect everything. There was a watch system. It's very but the, but the boy, watches are, are very, very poorly done. It's just, there's a total mishmash. You know, people don't know and don't care. There's no discipline. There's no authority. It's just, you know, it's a catch-ass, catch-can type of deal. It's true that you have to have a command structure at sea on a boat that 
where you have unquestioned obedience. But as I've said before, even if you were Admiral's epaulets and have all that wearing all the brass in the world, if you, if you lack the knowledge, the crew will know this instinctively and immediately, and they will lose respect for you, and therefore, the whole thing will fall apart. Discouraged, Herb Connie temporarily reduces his role in the Voyaging Society's affairs. Instead, devotes himself to completing commissioned paintings. From now on, the man largely responsible for launching the project will make his voyages on canvas. The wind speed was about uh, 15. Now led by Ben Finney, computer studies are made on canoe performance. Though troubled by Hukulea's occasional eccentricities, he is determined to remain true to ancient designs insofar as they can be fixed. The first Polynesians left no blueprints. But early mariners did leave petroglyphs. So this, this shape it should uh, work out well for Hukulea. In search for a better sail design, Ben Finney travels to Hawaii's Big Island with a newly appointed canoe captain, Kavika Kapahulehua, and New Zealander David Lewis, authority on non-instrument navigation, famed for his oceanic sailing exploits. You can come around this end. <clears throat> I think we have enough room for that one over there. Just, what's that just cool in Hawaiian? Uh, Lama Kanipa. Lama Kanipa. Yeah. Pa. Pa. Hello, perhaps. Perhaps. Uh -huh. perhaps. Features of the sail for Hukulea. For Kavika alone, the crab claw sail carved in the rock belongs to his ancestral origins. But the new master of Hokulea is a man of the present, not of the past. Frequent participant in Pacific sailing races, Kavika has long commanded tourist crowded catamarans on island sunset cruises. His growing crew includes some of the best watermen in the islands. First mate, David Lyman, by profession a state harbor pilot. Billy Richards, marine biologist and professional diver. Buffalo Keaulana, lifeguard and one of Hawaii's finest surfers. John Cruz, carpenter and illustrator. Bugi Kalama from Kauai, entertainer and canoe coach. Duki Kuahulu, master weaver and a canoe captain. Sam Kalalau, a ranch foreman and fisherman from Maui. Clifford Amo, commercial diver and canoe coach. Shorty Bertelman, construction worker from Hawaii's Big Island. And Kimo Hugo, a fire rescue man for whom Hokulea has become an all-consuming interest. Valued passenger is Hoku, a vegetarian poi dog. From the distant island of Satawal in Micronesia, Ben Finney has brought a gravely childlike man, seldom lost in space or time. Schooled in ancient methods of navigation by star and ocean swell, it is Pius Mao Pialug who must try, without instruments, to guide Hokulea to Tahiti, across 3,000 miles of open sea. As he fashions a gift for Kimo's parents, he has the serenity of a man whose world is whole. In January, the crew assembles, divided into two teams, one for the southward journey, one for the return voyage. 25 men and two women have been chosen. Often forsaking jobs and private lives, they begin rebuilding the canoe. A new sail shape is based on the petroglyph contours. To ensure against another swamping, bulkheads dividing the hull compartments where provisions will be stored are caulked and waterproofed.
10 Iacos, the great laminated cross pieces that join the twin hulls, are fitted into place. Under Mao's direction, lashings are begun, each a task requiring 16 man hours. Like a spell, Mao's presence has brought calm to his often troubled Hawaiian crewmates. Though Herb Kane is still absent and Ben Finney is ill, the work moves forward steadily. All know that now, time is of the essence. Delayed by the swamping, departure is now scheduled not later than May 1st. There's a cavity in there, okay? Because it was all rotten. And well, I'm not saying it. take this out. I'm yeah. saying fair it down. Oh, absolutely. Oh, but, but see, that's where there was a misunderstanding <laughs> yesterday. Everybody jumped to their guns. It is going to be fair down, and it will keep the same lines of the, that you have originally. Yeah, but not what he's doing here. You see, he was adding on another layer. Checking progress after weeks of inattention, the absentee overseers of the project are shocked by what they find. In an effort to prevent the shallow-hulled canoe from side-slipping in crosswinds, a small keel has been added. It is a change that destroys the canoe's fidelity to early Polynesian design, and according to Herb Kane and Ben Finney, compromises the validity of the entire voyage as a scientific experiment. There is no way. This lashing is, is for a little 26-foot outrigger Micronesian canoe and it doesn't belong on a five and a quarter ton vessel. The lashings, done with such long and painstaking effort, are declared unsafe. The criticism stirs up a hornet's nest with Mao and the resentful crew. Now he's not Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Fo. Don't take off. You know, now he's uh, no work for what for too many tuck, 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 tuck. In sullen compliance, the volunteer crew members remove the miles of Dacron in the disputed lashings. With the departure day imminent, repairs at last near completion. The offending keel is removed, the new lashings put on. Despite the rift with the leaders, the crew works with a brighter spirit. In some curious way that even they cannot define to themselves, the canoe no longer belongs to the Haoli participants. Symbol of a half-forgotten past they had nearly lost, the crewmen have made it theirs. <laughs> Assured of money for their families during their absence, the crewmen await departure. But now on the eve of sailing, Ben Finney and Tommy Holmes bring news that precipitates another crisis. Essentially, we're broke. Well, uh, Dave and Tommy and I were talking about this this morning. We had some ideas, that, you know, according to need, whether you have a mortgage, a wife, a family, or husband and family, however, you have certain fixed expenses. These seem to be more important than the bachelor who doesn't have these. But we also felt rather than us trying to dictate how it should be divided, we're going to we're going to toss the ball back to the crew. You know, this was brought to your attention five days ago. Yeah. The money never came within the five days. These guys been eating rice and soil. Yeah. All the bills have stacked up. I know. You know. I know. And you guys want to leave tomorrow? You guys want everybody to work now to get the boat ready for Sunday? These guys don't have any personal belongings. Hey, they're going to go to Tahiti with the puka shirt and empty compartment. And you're going to get $500 now to complete everything from here to Tahiti and back. I told you in the beginning, you want the best waterman out here, and we got the best. You got to take care of them and their families. Okay, I, I'll guarantee these guys are going to take, you know, I don't know how long yeah, I, I... I told you you created a monster. And take care of it. Okay. But most of all, take care of these Doing guys. Best to take care of it. My absolute best, you know. That's all I can say. That's not the Hawaiian way, placing a deadline to leave. Okay, well, that's not my deadline. That's just, you know, I have... I know, it's the a computer's camera. deadline. That's not right. my decision. I, I, the computer runs everything. I got, I got proof right here. Right here. This morning's news. Before the television reporters he has secretly invited, Kimo now publicly attacks the Voyaging Society leaders. Uh, guess what? Leave us. These problems are still present. 
Lack of seamanship, safety procedures, shortcomings in the canoe's construction, replacement of power covering for each hull. Why? The computer thinks no problem. That's the biggest word around here. No problem, no problem. Look at these two pictures. We're not ready to go. There's dissension amongst the leaders, but there's unity amongst the crew. Don't forget tomorrow, gang, when we go out with a puka shirt, we get the boat ready, puka shirt, puka pants, and a uh, check in our pocket for what, $500. And all of these things not done. Right next to you is gonna be champagne, toot toot, you know. How's it, how cool there? You guys going, all right. Wish you luck. That's my feelings. But I think I know what the Hawaiian people deserve. They've been taken for granted. 200 years later, gang. In swift response, Kavika asserts command. You can sign on as crew member for the trips. For those of you who want to go, for those of you who don't feel that you are obligated, you don't want to sign for it, fine, no problem. But we do have a lot of work to do from now on, from right now till tonight. Though accepting the meager terms, some of the crew insist that Mao be appointed sailing master, thus dividing some of Kavika's authority. Yet, as they complete the final rigging, a mood of uncertainty and bitterness prevails. To gain a heading against the trade winds, Okulea will make an easterly crossing from Honolulu to Maui, where the long voyage will actually begin. On the island of Maui, remote from Honolulu's traffic and high-rise buildings, Ritual figures from the Hawaiian past preside over the departure feast and ceremony. For the crew and members of the Voyaging Society, for friends, families, and well-wishers, it is a great moment. But while the traditional foods are prepared, a somber threat hangs over the festivities. Like an unbidden guest, trouble still stalks Hokulea and her crew. I was hurt Saturday, seeing chemo. <clears throat> All the photographers from television news and newspapers were there. First question asked, when is the meeting starting? So I was kind of startled to find out that, that, that people was invited to the meeting. And so I said, I'm taking it upon myself to relieve him on two days from going from Hawaii to Tahiti. I was always concerned for the welfare of the crew right, right. and the security of the canoe. And what I, what, what I did mention, what the point I was trying to get across uh, last week, I was questioning the immediate rush right after all of these crew members did all of the work. Nobody else. I never saw any water directors come down there. That's what I questioned, the rush to have come all of this way to put over $100,000 in a, a project that's so unique and to lose it just like that. We have our little Popapa Pilikia. We're still on land. We can settle this. But I want you to realize that the captain has the last say. Kimo, I know everybody said we don't want you to apologize. But our Pilikia is you and the captain. And I want you to ask him to forgive you. I'm asking you the same because we are Hawaiian. We're not Aulis. We're not nobody else. We're Hawaiian. Everybody standing with us is a Hawaiian today. Call him me, Hi. 
kau lima nama dua. Nah, awak kau mek apa aku ulu lima? Awak kau mek ulu lalu ulu apa mek kau lima? Oi kau mek ay oi uah heva oi noi oya. Okay, now the decision is now. What it's gonna be? Are you? I will not be a member of the crew going to Tahiti. I will uh, decide if it's if it has been made clear by Kapena that I will be on the return return trip back because we do have more than qualified individuals going down, and I'm concerned about coming back. And this will open another seat for Clifford and especially Boogie to be on the canoe to go down. It's your decision. That's all I ask you. Yes. Okay, I still want you to apologize with the captain. Sir, it will lighten the, the, the heaviness in your heart. And my son, I'm asking you to shake hands with the captain. Oh. I want you to do that for your father's own sake. You fought, you put in all of your life. You sacrificed a good part of your life for this venture. All you have to do is shake the captain's hand, and even if we don't say the words apology, yeah. apologize. It'll be sealed there just by you grasping the captain's hand and say, okay, Captain, let's go. Let's get out of here. Let's get on with the show. Pull it tight. Pull it tight. Pull it tight. Pull it tight. That's right. Okay. When I pull it, when you say I, how we can you say I? Okay. No, I know what you're making now. All of my cake go. I know how to make it. I'll hit 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 Opa aqui ele pula e louco e não com a cor que que é meio com a nema lele, amém. Come on, we're Hawaiian. Like a calm voice from some remote and mythic past, speaking in his native Sarawalese, Mao Pialog now addresses a quiet admonition to the crew. Now we are going on the ocean. There, everything we do is different from what we do on land. On the ocean, we don't eat the same, or sleep the same, or work the same. We do what the captain says. He is our mother and father. Our problems, our quarrels, we leave on land. We change all our ways so we can survive. It is May 1, 1976. As in the earliest voyages, provisions of fresh fruit and perishable produce are stowed aboard. To demonstrate that breeding stock of domestic animals also could survive the long voyages, the canoe will carry chickens, Hoku the dog, and a pig named Maxwell. Although Ben Finney, Tommy Holmes, and David Lewis will make the voyage with the Hawaiian crew, Herb Connie will remain behind. Mao, in whose mind the constellations move, gives up a last vestige of modern man, his wristwatch chronometer. <laughs> I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are our Viking from Hawaii. I ask God to bless and be with you. Kumoko hoku lea, oi kumoko ana i kulena. Ololo mai ke kua, malama oi ilo ke noko makua. Keiki a mai ku hane hemalele. Amen. Let's sing E Hawaii. E Hawaii. As each crewman touches water, he belongs to the sea. Not until journey's end, May he return to land. chosen to stay behind. Yet, like a ghost, his presence will walk Okulea's deck in days to come.
Curving east for advantage against prevailing trade winds, Hokulea's projected course crosses the doldrums and the equator, then sweeps through the Tuamotu archipelago to Tahiti. But Hokulea does not sail a map. Committed to wind and current, the canoe matches herself against the encompassing sea. For the crew, the first days are exhilarating and strange. On a narrow deck, crowded with gear, animals, and provisions, the men can barely stir, while around them stretches the endless space of trackless ocean. Yet across this vacancy, Mao finds his way. The stars are his stepping stones. Like a finely tuned instrument, his body registers and responds to the slightest shifts of wind or current, to the complex systems of ocean swells hardly apparent, even to such an experienced navigator as David Lewis. Having oriented Mao to the stars and currents of these unfamiliar waters, Lewis now will record the process by which Mao sets his course. Yeah, but I think a little bit, not so much. Can you point to the... Eleven days out. Asked by Lewis to indicate the straight line direction to Tahiti from their present position, Mao indicates a bearing of 190 degrees. We're coming to right. Mao still sails on a southeasterly course at an angle from his actual destination. Thus, when nearing journey's end, with wind and current at his back, he can safely turn west and pass through the Tuamotus to Tahiti. Under the northeast trade winds, the canoe plunges through days of rough weather. While Mao keeps vigil and seldom sleeps, the crew labors through rain squalls, eating cold food, working bilge pumps, sleeping in the wet. Because of the efficient new sail design, Mao can easily hold Hokulea close to the wind, making better than a hundred nautical miles a day. Like a thunderclap from a cloudless sky, trouble strikes. One of the lines anchoring the aft mast has broken free. The sudden strain threatens to snap the mast itself. Hey, don't select. Don't select. No more. Put it in the hole. In power. Somebody. By the quick response of leaders and crew, the crisis passes. Through uneventful days, Hokulea speeds southward. day, Mao uses the sun to estimate his changing position. By night, he passes from star to star. For as Hokulea moves toward the equator, reference points like the North Star drop from view on the horizon behind her. Progress ceases. As if spellbound in a silent sea, Hokulea lies trapped in the doldrums. Though sometimes vessels may sail through the area in a few hours, 
Others may be idled for days in the hot and humid air. by Mao to wait until late afternoon. An impatient crew seeks relief from the morning heat. And as Mao had predicted, drinks excessive quantities of fresh water. Precious water, but no relief. Haunted by old grievances, crew and leaders again draw apart. Yet, there is no escape. In this immensity, they are prisoners of each other. You know, it's so still. And everything the man had never done was, was just coming back, coming back stronger, too strong, in fact, you know. Something closed in on the guys, and they're so depressed. Some of our crew members became extremely disheartened. Every one of those people were persons who were not used to the ocean. But uh, there was no reason for despair. And I was just hoping that friction wouldn't start to the point where it get really bad outside, where bloodshed would happen. Now, that's where the fear was. But as Hokulea regains momentum, tensions temporarily subside. Crossing the equator on the 23rd day, a mounting suspense can only be resolved by Mao. Will Hokulea reach her target or miss it? Not given to wasteful emotion, Mao himself shows little concern. First day. Since yesterday, Mao has watched the turns, pointed the canoe to follow their homing flight at dusk. Not far ahead lies land. Tahitian, Ben Finney calls to ask the name of the island. <laughs> Dead on course for Tahiti, hardly 200 miles ahead, Mao has brought the canoe to the tiny atoll of Mataiva, westernmost island of the French Tuamotus. Alerted 
by radio reports that Hokulea might be nearby, the atoll's handful of isolated citizens will not allow her crew to escape their hospitality. with feasting and entertainment, the crew embarks on the final lap of its journey. As word spreads of Hokulea's navigational feat, welcoming vessels hurry out. Friends toss champagne aboard. It is a dangerous gift. Control, eh? Having safely touched land, crew and leaders release pent-up rancors and petty grievances, a food experiment that failed, a smuggled radio which secretly entertained several crewmen but cast an unfair doubt on Mao's stunning achievement. Almost to their own astonishment, the crew's anger explodes. Like a flame, Buffalo's fury spreads to other shipmates. It seems like nobody really be behind the crew. The crew got to get together, put that real strong, tight, and almost forcefully do what we got to do. You know, just come out in numbers and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to dump the holly, we're going to dump this, we're going to dump that. We're going to do our trip. But it, seems, it seems, just seems like that we don't get the backing. We don't get the backing like we should. And this crew, not this canoe, more than anybody else on this canoe. We put the thing together, we sail them between the islands. Everybody all the Hawaiians on this canoe thought in the beginning that it would be just like between island trips, man. It was, it was really far, it was really together. We cannot. What I'm saying is, we don't get the backing, all right? So we, we decided, okay, that's all right. Everybody else like the holidays come, we're gonna let the holidays come. So we just changed the whole idea as to how, what, what we feel about this canoe. We make this canoe just like us, half-breeds. Sober chagrin, the crew greets Tahiti's welcoming throng of 15,000. Still remembering a flurry of blows on Hokulea's deck, they hear the cheers of the greatest Polynesian gathering since the arrival of Captain Cook. Kimo and the return crew rush to embrace their comrades. But fearful of further dissensions, Kimo will not make the journey back. Nor will Mao return to Hawaii. Aloof from distracting tensions, he watched the stars. Within hours, in a farewell message that exempts only two crewmen, Mao will deliver a stunning rebuke to the crew, then fly home to Satawal. Thus 
Thus enter the conquerors in their flower crowns, perhaps no less than other conquerors, flawed and ineradicably human. Against all odds, in their puka shirts, they did what they set out to do. Equally human in triumph and failure, they were simply better as mariners than as brothers. In Hokulea, Hawaiians have tried to reclaim their birthright to an ancient culture. In the mirror of the past, they have caught a fleeting image of themselves, of their identity. Yet they know they cannot stay there, cannot escape the restless tides of present and future. They cannot go back to Satawal. Like their voyaging ancestors, they too must point their sails into the wind, reach for landfalls still unmarked. But perhaps the old stars can lead them a part of the way. Man's search for his past may enable him to better enter the future. The search into the minds and hearts of others is a different kind of quest. These voyages into the soul may prove more difficult than those that span great distances in time, but from dissension may arise understanding. This could be the real discovery of the voyage of the Hokulea. Next time, on the best of the National Geographic specials, we'll look at other fascinating corners of our ever-changing and ever-expanding world. Till then, I'm Mike Farrell for the National Geographic Society. Be sure to join us this Wednesday night at 8 when the Infinite Voyage looks at the history and consequences of, and the proposed solutions to, the crisis in the atmosphere. And stay with Eleven now as a motorcyclist from Wall Street traverses China. The long ride is next on Travels.